They were the first big animals to fly. But their bodies were so bizarre, it's hard to imagine how they got into the air. They were pterosaurs, and they owned the skies for 150 million years. I'm blown away by these animals. Pterosaurs are probably the weirdest uh, animals that live on this world. They are the closest things to living dragons the planet has ever seen. They're not birds, and they're not bats. So what in God's name are they? They're impossible animals. They're reptiles, and yet they're flying around. How on earth could these animals ever fly? And can they fly again? Now, join the quest to build one. Hunt for evidence that unlocks the mystery of their flight. Piece together clues that may lead to the largest creature that ever flew. Come face to face with the monsters of the sky. Earth is a world where strange monsters swim and roam. The planet is in the grip of giant reptiles. And the ancient game of hunt and kill plays out on a scale we wouldn't even recognize. But there is another dimension to this world, often overlooked, but more remarkable. It's the realm of the most mysterious creature of them all. Pterosaurs. Flying reptiles, some bristling with teeth. After insects, pterosaurs were the first animals to fly. They became a global air force. Pterosaurs appear abruptly in the fossil record 220 million years ago. We don't have a clue about how they evolved. We do know that after they arrive, they spread around the globe, undergoing some of the strangest costume changes in the history of life. Some had short tails, others long. Some were as small as a sparrow, Others were giants. Many were covered with something like hair and sported crests as if out of Mardi Gras. They had outrageous jaws, fine-tuned for hunting. But for all their variety, it's flight that defined them. Somehow, these long-necked, gawky creatures not only figured it out, they perfected it. 220 million years ago, this skill set them apart from every other large creature. Birds didn't even exist yet. Pterosaurs ruled the skies. We're only just beginning to solve the mysteries of their reign. What was it like in the world of pterosaurs? How big do they really get? And how
How does an animal that looks like a broken umbrella get its ungainly body into the air and actually fly? Now, an unprecedented rush of fossil discoveries from all over the world is giving us answers. And the most intriguing find could rewrite the record books on pterosaur size. Paleontologist Dino Fry leads a major investigation of a recent discovery in Israel's Negev desert. He thinks this is a finger bone from a pterosaur of unprecedented and almost unbelievable dimensions. If Fry is right, there's only one other pterosaur that comes anywhere close. It's a colossus called Quetzalcoatlus, or Ketz for short. Discovered in Texas in the 1970s, it was the largest flying animal ever seen. This monster soars over North America for millions of years. It has a wingspan of nearly 40 feet. Ketz is over three times wider than an albatross, the bird with the biggest wingspan, and even five feet wider than an F-16. Ketz cruises at an estimated 45 miles an hour and weighs 300 pounds, over six times heavier than the largest flying bird. But the new discovery in Israel may be evidence of something a lot bigger. When I saw this big bone for the first time, I couldn't believe what I saw. I first thought that must be a tree trunk or something like that. But a close examination revealed that it must be a bone. And then I had this goosebumpy feeling and I couldn't speak anymore. If this really is a pterosaur bone, and that's not an easy thing to determine, it would be from a new giant that would make Ketz seem like a Cornish game hen. Whenever pterosaurs were discovered, their finders thought they found the biggest. And I don't know where it ends. Makes it big. Finding out just how big it is will become a global detective story. And there's another investigation. One that's trying to figure out how pterosaurs flew. Yeah, hi, guys. Hey, Margo. Led by Dutch engineer and Stanford professor Margo Gerritsen, a team will try to build a model, a lifelike flapping pterosaur that can actually fly. and there are instructions for building a pterosaur. They're written in stone. You have to get everything from the fossil record. So it's fascinating to try to put it all together like one big puzzle. It was a beautiful design, something that's extremely hard to duplicate. It's gonna be real challenging, Paul, because if you... To figure out how pterosaurs flew, we will have to understand the strength of their bones and how they moved. the shape and construction of their wings, and how they flapped to create lift and thrust to power their flight. The Stanford model is at an early stage, more airplane than animal, but it will become realistic. As the team first builds it, Five, four, and then tries three, to keep it in the air, two, one. Go. Their goal is to solve one problem. What are the flight secrets of the first large animal to take to the skies? Yeah. 
we used to think that birds and bats were the only big flyers in the skies. But a strange discovery near Solnhofen, Germany shattered this myth. This limestone quarry is a huge evidence locker loaded with clues about life in a shallow lagoon 150 million years ago. Less than 250 years ago, a quarryman found something baffling. What was it? Naturalists of the 1700s fumbled for explanations based on familiar creatures. Some thought it was a type of duck. Others believed it was a kind of bat. Yet others saw the wings as good for swimming underwater. But the fossil defied them. It was unlike anything ever collected before. One man finally unraveled the mystery. That sleuth was Georges Cuvier. He was the first to figure out that animals had gone extinct. He was the first to understand what dinosaurs were. And here, two centuries ago, he applied his forensic eye to the German fossil and blew the case wide open. Cuvier received a drawing of this strange petrified animal. And he realized suddenly that it was completely a new order of animal. It was a new branch on the tree of life. Cuvier spotted a tiny bone in the jaw that's like those found in only one kind of animal. Somehow, the weird winged creature was a reptile. What was a reptile doing in the sky? You have a reptile flying? This was completely uh, surprising. How could a cold-blooded, lethargic beast like a crocodile launch its bulk into the air? Cuvier found the answer in the hand. A single finger had grown enormously, enough to support the wing. Cuvier called the creature pterodactylus, roughly wing on the finger. It was a revolution in biology. Cuvier could only imagine what it looked like when it took to the air. We've known that pterosaurs flew, but only recently have we started to figure out how. It's easy to overlook what an incredible amount of skill it takes to fly. To get answers about how pterosaurs did it, take a look at the wings of birds and bats. All flying animals use the bones of the hands and fingers to fly, but they do it in different ways. Birds have lost the fourth and fifth fingers. They take the first three fingers, and these form the supports for the feathers. In bats, it's a different story. 
the four fingers stretch and control the membrane while the thumb is free. With pterosaurs, the pinky is lost and the ring finger is stretched. That's the signature weirdness of pterosaurs, a mega finger that supports the entire wing. But how do you replicate such an evolutionary masterpiece? The model's mega finger is built up with layer after layer of thin carbon fibers. It's then wrapped with Kevlar tape for extra strength. And now, the model has its own flexible and nearly unbreakable mega finger. But how did the wing it supported generate lift? There's a striking similarity between pterosaur wings and the sails on racing yachts. Air rushing over the curved sail moves a boat forward. Turn that on its side and you have lift from a wing. Now we can calculate the lift of any pterosaur, whether the size of a sparrow or the size of a jet. And in Israel, the hunt continues for flying giants. Dino Fry is now convinced that this big new fossil is a pterosaur bone. In pterosaur fossils, the bone wall is very thin. And it's built of interlaced layers that are strong like plywood. Inside the bone, there are fine hair-like struts and the inner cavity is filled with air. And this makes pterosaur bones extremely lightweight. So light that even a giant could take wing. Fry comes to one more conclusion. The fossil from Israel is a wing bone. And it's just one of four that made up the megafinger. In Fry's mind, this thing is off the scale. It will take more evidence to determine just how big it was. With lightweight wings of any size, pterosaurs go everywhere, including Inner Mongolia, China. Paleontologist and National Geographic explorer Paul Serino knows they've been found here before. Over a hundred million years ago, this area was covered by a vast lake, a pterosaur paradise. Since pterosaurs are best preserved near water, Serino looks for traces of them in the ancient lake bed, which is turned to rock. You pick up a rock, first thing a geologist wants to do is break it. Every rock could reveal a key event in the life of a pterosaur. You can see individual events that probably represent storms on an individual day, 110 million years ago, that covered up animals that died earlier that day and maybe the day before. Hey, Paul, we got a fish. Take a look at this. Ha! He'd like nothing better than to find a pterosaur fossil. Little fish there. But he's only finding pterosaur prey. Fish. Still, it's one more clue about this baffling flyer. You see an animal that is like nothing else you've ever seen. It's the most bizarre, ungainly, beautiful creature. I mean, it's flying with, with a finger. Evidence of that finger is elusive. 
pterosaur fossils are extremely fragile. It's very rare to get a beautiful specimen of a pterosaur. Nevertheless, he did it. A few years ago, on an expedition to Africa, Serino found a pterosaur where no one expected it. Every once in a while, you walk into an area and you find something that could take years to find. It's a pterosaur bone, uh, probably a wing bone. Because pterosaur bones are so unusual, we decided to go and collect that one. I left a group of students to do that, and it was taking them an awful long time. Finally, they reported back that, uh, well, it had sort of grown. They had this folded wing finger measuring you know, the length of a human body. So it's missing this end, but this end is... Pterosaurs were virtually unknown from Africa. There were just bits and pieces recorded, and it really was an incredible discovery. Before this expedition, major pterosaur discoveries had come from Europe, China, and the Americas. The discovery of our African pterosaur showed they had a global reach. They truly conquered every continent. Pterosaurs were a worldwide force, but they faced threats. One may have come from the jaws of an African super predator. Because on the ground, pterosaurs were sitting ducks. When Serino found his pterosaur, he also found fossils of a heavyweight predator called Super Croc. This is um, Sarcosuchus, the giant crocodile of... Uh, its jaw of alone creature. measured and over six and, feet. Uh, one huge skull. Did pterosaurs clash with this giant? Each may have hit where the other was weakest. Pterosaurs may have gone for easy pickings in the super croc's nest. And the croc probably attacked when the awkward pterosaurs were on the ground. Investigators recently unearthed evidence of a similar conflict, the first ever discovered. A fossil find in Canada may show that pterosaurs tangled with dinosaurs. Dinosaur Provincial Park was once a North American Serengeti. Here, pterosaurs tried to stay clear of danger on the ground. But they had to eat, and that meant landing. Eons later, a fossil hunter found hints of what may have been one pterosaur's last landing. I walked around a corner and took a couple more steps and looked down and there was uh, this long skinny bone. And I'm like, hmm, this is interesting. Interesting because it was part of a pterosaur's megafinger. And fragile pterosaur fossils don't last long in the open air. Not only that, the first bone led to several more, and then to a kind of smoking gun. A tooth from something like a velociraptor sunk to the hilt in the pterosaur's shin. 
What happened? Below the pterosaurs, raptors were constantly on the hunt. Pterosaurs were vulnerable. Their power was in the air. Flying was their ultimate survival tool. Pterosaurs dominated the skies, and they did this for 140 million years, which is a tremendously long period of time. Primarily, they did this because they were the first to get into the skies. Before birds evolved, Pterosaurs had the skies to themselves for 70 million years. They spread across the globe and morphed into a wild variety of forms. Aside from the power of flight, they had another thing in common. Pterosaurs were incredibly effective predators. They could gobble up almost anything they could find. Their jaws tell the story of what they ate. We know of a lot of pterosaurs have no teeth in their jaws. It's quite possible that they were scavengers, and perhaps in some cases they fed on the bodies of dead dinosaurs. Many pterosaurs were aggressive hunters. Some were able to snag their fish on the wing. These big, long, sharp pointed teeth basically are the tools of a fish catcher who wants to make darn sure that he grabs his prey when he sticks his beak into the water. One kind of pterosaur used a sieve of a thousand teeth to strain for crustaceans. Other pterosaurs have long, sharp-pointed jaws, which they use to leave a shellfish off rocks or pluck them out of the sand. For all their variety of feeding techniques, pterosaurs were often found by water, shorelines, rivers, and lakes. And water wasn't just a place to eat. It was also a place to be eaten. Tylosaurs. Giant marine reptiles up to 50 feet long lived in prehistoric seas. Above them flew the nyctosaur. Its freakish three-foot-tall head crest, as big as its wing, may have supported a kind of sail. To find prey, the nyctosaur had to fly low. To understand how pterosaur bones work together for flight, Margot Gerritsen needs more facts. So she visits Paul Serino's lab with model team member Jim Cunningham. The first bone we found led to another one, and it led The mega finger of Serino's African find contains vital clues. Well, when I first saw the fossils, I was just blown away. Because it makes the whole thing come very much alive. This joint here, right at the at the articulation of the, of the wing finger and the wrist are really key areas for your model, I think. And, uh, some of the... These bones look very fragile, but then you look at the structure and it is incredibly beautifully designed and gives the pterosaur bones a lot of strength. These demanding specs are what Gerritsen will have to copy in her model. 
So now for, for us, when we start building the replica, it's really important to know the movement that it, the pterosaur could have had in the arm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so do you have any ideas about that, when the movement in the wrist or the elbow? Well, you know, when, when these bones are buried, you don't want to lose any clues, so we kept the bones in the original position. Where they For the model team, handling these bones conjures up the living animal they'll try to mimic. Its success in prehistoric Africa hinged on its extraordinary flight control. The 16-foot African pterosaur cast its shadow on duckbills. It cruised over prehistoric turtles. And with every skimming flight over water, it risked being torn from the sky. To avoid that fate, pterosaurs could not only fly, they could fly well, even at low altitudes. We have evidence of these aerial skills, and not from a new fossil wing, but from ancient tracks preserved in stone. No one ever thought that pterosaurs were skilled flyers. Their clunky bodies seemed to prohibit anything but gliding. But near Toulouse, France, a new piece of evidence has trashed this myth. Two investigators examined the rarest of pterosaur fossils. Not petrified bones, but fossilized footprints. It's a unique site in the world. This is the first site that actually preserves pterosaur tracks that everyone agrees are pterosaur tracks. One set of footprints here is as vivid to trained eyes as a series of flash photographs. It's the only known record of a pterosaur landing. And how a flyer lands reveals how well it controls its flight. Strong thermals in this area attract another flying species. One that only recently discovered the secrets of flight. gliders have excellent flight control. They can land slowly. What about pterosaurs? This pterosaur reveals extraordinary flight control. It touched down slowly. We're going to see the animal land like that with the claws this way, this way. So he's landing here and moving forward like that. Then landing again in these tracks here, these two footprints. And then for the first time, the hands come in and they land there. Weirdly, pterosaurs have hands halfway down their wings. While standing, they bend their mega fingers up and back. This trackway reveals a key fact about pterosaur flight. 
They didn't make a running landing as many birds do. They slowed themselves down during final approach. So there's basically two ways it can do that. It can glide down, stall with its wings, and drop. Or it can come down, flap its wings to slow its descent, and land very gently. We're not exactly sure how pterosaurs did it, but it looks like they were pretty capable of flapping their wings to, to slow down like that. So pterosaurs used their wings as brakes. They weren't clumsy flyers after all. These are animals that flew very well and were very adept in the air. The unique landing track also helped solve another mystery, how pterosaurs walked. On two legs, like a bird. On four legs, like a bat. Or did they scoot on their bellies, like penguins? Because their forelimbs were so long and their hind limbs were shaped so much like birds, I reasoned that they probably would have only walked on two legs, their back legs. But in fact, these tracks showed that they did walk on four legs. You're wrong all the time in science, that's all right. In the hunt for the ultra giant, tracks will offer a different kind of evidence. Evidence about size. Fossil footprints recently found in Mexico look like nothing ever seen before. When we saw these footprints, we could not believe what we saw. We saw footprints of a gigantic flying reptile. The first reaction, we, we, we just stood there and we stood there with our mouth is agape, nobody could speak actually. What we saw, we, we both we both thought, oh that's the biggest the biggest pterosaur footprints ever. Fry's understanding of the tracks will be controversial. Prehistoric footprints can be hard to interpret. A footprint is not simply the shape of the foot that laid it. It's also what condition the ground was, and it's also the kind of motion that an animal makes. The Mexican tracks have a very elongated type of footfall. And this would appear to be the sort of thing that a pterosaur would make, but it's also the sort of thing that any kind of animal would make if it walked in really mushy ground. But the hand and foot outlines are so different that Fry concludes only pterosaurs could have left these tracks. The first thing we did, we measured the size of the feet and the hands and the stride. Each print is two and a half feet long. That's a size 72 shoe. But the wildest part is yet to come. At first, it looks as if one print is following another. But Fry thinks these tracks are only those of the left hand and foot. The right prints lay buried nearby. That would mean this thing has a stance nearly 15 feet wide, about the distance from the free throw line to the backboard. The evidence suggests the hip of this monster is just about as high as a basketball hoop. To Fry, the case for a record-breaking giant is coming together. But where does the huge fossil in Israel fit in? Is it somehow connected to the Mexican trackway? Monster of monsters, big as a skyscraper! Ever since we figured out what pterosaurs were, they've been living large in our imaginations. Look out! They've seen us! But one man was more obsessed than most. 
aeronautical engineer Paul McCready. He's known for inventing weird flyers like the Gossamer Albatross, the first human-powered craft to fly across the English Channel. Captivated by pterosaurs, McCready set out in the 1980s to make the giant, Ketz, fly again. His team's biggest challenge was flight control, especially figuring out how to steer. Fossil expert Kevin Padian advised the project. They thought it really had to have a tail, and it didn't have a tail. But instead, they were very clever. This animal had a very long neck. So they used the neck as the way to balance and steer the animal. But that's not how real pterosaurs did it. And even with this compromise, sometimes it crashed. get it off the ground, get it up in the air. It was fantastic at the time. We now know pterosaurs mostly relied on their incredibly sophisticated wings for steering. McCready's wings weren't up to the task. They were an unlifelike, rigid carbon fiber. His solution to flight control was aeronautical. He created an airplane in pterosaur's clothing. <laughs> Garretson, on the other hand, aims for a lifelike pterosaur that steers like the real thing. Really what's helping us most is that we know a lot more about pterosaurs. Because lots of fossils have been found. We know much more about how they were built. Take the head. Fossil evidence shows that pterosaurs like this flew with their heads angled down, not parallel to the ground as McCready's model did. A lowered head makes flight far more difficult to control. But that's how real pterosaurs did it. Weight is another challenge. Power to weight is the ratio that governs all flight. And here the model has another advantage. New super light components. The batteries are a lot lighter and very powerful and that's helping us a lot. The batteries hold 15 times as much juice per pound as McCready's did. The servo motors are far smaller, lighter, and more powerful. But the biggest difference is the wing. The goal is to solve the steering problem by copying the complexity of a real pterosaur's wing. McCready's wing had only a single moving joint the shoulder. This wing has five joints. Now these lifelike wings are ready to be tested. Mounted on the fuselage of a remote control airplane. They'll fly at about 25 miles an hour, the estimated speed of the living animal. Like a kite, the wing membrane fills with air, taking on an airfoil shape which produces lift. The membrane's filling very nicely, and so hopefully that means we'll, we'll get a bit of lift out of it. This is the first chance for pilot Michael Luvara to practice steering. To do this, he uses a model airplane radio controller. 
Just like a real pterosaur, he reacts to the wind by adjusting the shape of the wings. Uvara is filling in for the pterosaur's brain. In this controlled test, the wing membrane works. But untethered, up in the sky, will it fly like the real thing? Getting into the air is such a big technical challenge, it looks like magic. And in pterosaurs, most of that magic is in the wings. At a runway for remote-controlled aircraft, the model's wings are about to be tested. At this stage, though, the model is only part pterosaur. It still needs an airplane tail to steer, and it uses a propeller for takeoff. It may look crude, but it boasts one of the most sophisticated wings ever built. Based on clues from pterosaur fossils, there are five movable joints inside the wing for steering. The shoulders rotate. They can also sweep forward and back. The wrists can also rotate and sweep, and the wing can bend at the elbow. Now the object is to experiment with them. That's the one thing that we're trying to figure out with, with this replica right now. Which of the joint motions are really critical for control? The answer was wired into the real pterosaur's brain. So Luvaro will have his work cut out for him. Here we go. Cool, though. <laughs> Wait a second. That servo might be locked. Yeah. Yeah. This one is still high under now or not? It's still a little high. The damage is minor. The model will get a second chance. It looks like it wants to lift off, so we might be actually get airborne. Constant tweaking is what it will take to fly like a pterosaur. It is a challenge. It's certainly um, like flying a ball, and you got to keep on trying balancing on top of the ball. Something wrong with the elbow, so that's better. Okay, here we go. Luvara couldn't react quickly enough to keep the model in the air. I would have loved to make it all the way around, but I think we need to do a little more work. Oh my goodness. Still, it's a breakthrough. Never before has such an adjustable, lifelike pterosaur wing flown. Something's loose here. But what will happen when the model becomes even more realistic? A living pterosaur had a big, meaty head. The animal didn't just glide, it flapped its wings. And the wing membrane itself was much more complex than the single layer of sailcloth tested today. A critical discovery will radically alter the model's wing. 
bringing it closer to the real thing. In the 1800s in Germany, bone hunters found a remarkably detailed fossil. Hidden inside, the defining feature of pterosaur wing membranes. Pterosaur wing membrane is a unique construction in nature. A layer of stiffening fibers controlled the wing shape. Fibers run diagonally from front to back to stiffen the wing and maintain the airfoil shape. No other flying creature uses this technology. If pterosaurs owned patents, this would be a gold mine. But how do you mimic that? The solution is ingenious. Nylon line. It's the closest thing to pterosaur wing fibers. Paleo artist Hall Train lays it in at the same angles as real pterosaur fibers. The fibers give a ripstop-like strength to the wing membrane. So the unique fibers in the pterosaur wing made the wing a lot stronger in this direction from the outer wing that carried a large, the large forces to the inner wing. And that allowed these large forces to be transferred to the upper arm and that was extremely strong in the pterosaurs. And because of that, the pterosaur wing was allowed to grow much larger than the wings in birds. These small fibers may be one of the critical features that allowed pterosaurs to grow to be giants. And pterosaur wings have even more secrets. Ultraviolet light allows investigators to see beyond hard bone into soft tissue. If we look at pterosaur fossils under ultraviolet light, we see structures we never dreamed about. The first revelation, dark canals. They're blood vessels that nourish and cool the wing membrane. Then, a key find. White flecks indicate muscle that could contract or relax to respond to flight conditions. Aircraft engineers, they get incredibly jealous because what they like to do is to build a wing that can be adjusted at any place to any circumstance in the air. And the only animals that achieved that were pterosaurs. Now we have a new picture of pterosaur wing membranes. Their unique layer cake construction may have looked like this. On the bottom are the stiffening fibers that help the wing keep its shape. Next is a layer of skin. On top of that are the muscle and blood vessels revealed by the UV images. The top layer is again skin, now with a fine hair-like covering that may smooth airflow and increase lift. And something in that top layer may have acted as a kind of sunblock. There's one layer that isolates the wing from the burning sun of the Mesozoic skies. The wings of bats have no such protection. Bats, they have the problem of the sun. They have to fly at night in order to avoid sunburn. In fact, many bats would die if they flew during the day. But pterosaurs could and did rule the daytime skies. With each new discovery, 
pterosaurs defy our expectations. And a recent find offers yet another twist. Pterosaurs didn't need practice to become amazing flyers. They were born that way. Pterosaurs don't give up their secrets easily. A fundamental fact about these outrageous flyers still eludes us. Were pterosaur babies born live, like some snakes or lizards? Or did they hatch from eggs? This question was answered only recently. In China, two paleontologists uncovered a fossil of a tiny, curled-up pterosaur. It was a pterosaur chick inside an egg. The discovery of the egg was probably the find of the century because this tells us something about pterosaurs, about how they reproduced, of which we had absolutely no information before. It was pure speculation and suddenly here we have an egg. But we don't yet know when young pterosaurs could fly. Dave Unwin has a controversial theory. Evidence shows that many baby pterosaurs died far from the nest. <laughs> we find the fossil remains of these individuals miles out at sea. And the only way they could get there is if they were actually flying animals and they got caught in a storm, ended up dead in the water and were buried in the sediments at the bottom. Could pterosaurs have flown right after hatching? Newborn birds and bats can't because they're awkwardly proportioned. To prove his hunch that pterosaurs could take wing right after birth, Unwin needs more evidence. So he's assembled a rare series of fossils, the same kind of pterosaur at three different ages. measures the length of the bones that make up the arm, then those of the megafinger. Unwin finds that the arm and the megafinger grow at the same rate. So the proportions of the wing don't change at all. As a check, he measures bones that have nothing to do with flying, like the beak. These proportions change, so only the flight-critical bones keep the same ratio. The evidence about pterosaur hatchlings now comes together. They have all their forelimbs, they have their wing membranes. These tiny little pterosaurs could fly. Flying babies challenge our ideas about flight. But so does a flying giant. Near Israel's Negev Desert, investigators searching for an enormous new pterosaur must now corroborate their evidence. Dino Fry thinks they've got a gigantic bone. Just one of four in the suspect's finger. 8,000 miles away in Mexico, they have giant footprints. Both clues suggest there once was a giant. But are they from the same suspect? If they could tie them together, the case would get much stronger. And that's what they do. By figuring out the age of the sites where the evidence was found, one in Mexico and one in Israel, they get a match. Both are about 71 million years old. 
But then Fry's case suffers a setback. A new test shows the big fossil from Israel isn't the evidence he thought it was. Under the microscope, a thin slice reveals patterns not visible to the naked eye. What Fry was convinced was bone turns out to be wood. Without the Megafinger's fossil, Fry's case now rests on the tracks alone. Tracks he's sure were made by an ultra-giant pterosaur. He will use this trackway to figure out size. By taking measurements of foot and leg bones from other pterosaurs, he can scale them up to match the prints. What was the wingspan? of the monster that once walked here. In the quest to understand pterosaur flight, investigators have zeroed in on a weird appendage, the tail. Early pterosaurs had long tails. 50 million years later, they'd begun to shrink. Their wings took up the slack, providing critical flight control. The history of aircraft shows the same progression. Early airplanes required big tails. Now, state-of-the-art craft can manage without them, but only because their wings are so sophisticated. Following the path of evolution, Gerritsen is shrinking the model's tail. But that will make stable flight harder. Now the wings will take on more steering control, just as in the real animal. Now when we're moving the wings back like this, the pterosaur will start to dive down. Where we want to go up again, we're moving the wings forward. Airplanes climb and descend in a completely different way. You have a, a horizontal part on the tail called an elevator for up and down control. You have wing flaps, and those help you turn left and right. And those are used along with the rudder on the tail, which is a side-to-side -side motion. But for a pterosaur without much tail, turning is more subtle. To turn, we use twist of the wing. This would be a right turn. We're moving the right wing down and the left wing up. And when we do that, it will make the pterosaur bank like this through a turn. And if we want to go left, we do that same twist the other way around. With its nimble wings, the model is nearly ready for its next flight test. But its body isn't finished evolving. Blood vessels reinforce the idea that a real pterosaur's membrane was living tissue. Another addition is more than cosmetic. Fossil evidence says the wings had hair. What was it for? It's possible that, like the dimples on a golf ball, that the fur created a boundary that allowed the air to travel faster over the surface and created more lift. After its makeover, the replica is so lifelike that it's given a name, Herky, 
short for Hercules. And now Herky gets an accessory. It's something real pterosaurs never evolved or needed, a parachute. Pterosaurs were also known for weird head crests. This metal one is part of a system to keep the head pointed into the wind, as real pterosaurs likely did in the air. For this crucial test, a large remote-controlled airplane will carry Herky aloft and then drop it. You want to check it? This is going to be our first flight with fur on the wings. It could go unstable. Um, but I think in general, generally, we're going to be quite all right with it. This is close to being the weirdest thing I've ever flown. Okay, mothership camera. Okay, lens cover off. Tail the team performs final line. checks at a makeshift mission control. Should be on channel two. All systems look good, okay. yeah, you're at it. but there's okay. one looking nagging looking worry. We don't have these fast ways to control this, as a pterosaur could have done. If something goes wrong, pterosaur would immediately have controlled it. We don't have that. Okay. Our response is a lot slower. There are a lot of risks associated with this, and we could lose it. Herky must rely on Michael Luvara's reflexes. A real pterosaur had a big advantage, a flight computer, its brain. A new discovery suggests that its brain could make precise micro-adjustments of the wing many times a second. In a major breakthrough, recent X-ray scans of their skulls revealed faint imprints of pterosaur brains. Pterosaurs had huge balance organs that were able to measure tiny changes in pitch, yaw, and roll. A large part of the brain helped keep the pterosaur's eyes steady during quick maneuvers. A critical skill for hunting. Controlling flight also requires gathering data from the wing, as well as from the arm and leg joints that keep the membrane taut. This information was analyzed by another processor that was the core of the flight computer. With Lavara filling in for Herky's brain and a second pilot controlling the mothership, a gliding test of Herky's lifelike wing begins. Altitude. Okay, one more lap. The pterosaur will be released at a height of 700 feet. Okay, countdown to launch. Five, four, three, two. One. Now. now. The drop is clean. The next step is critical. The head, pointing straight ahead for takeoff, must be angled down into the realistic position. <laughs> but now Herky pitches down. Bavara tries to release the parachute. It doesn't respond. Why did that parachute not come up? Herky hits the ground nose first at 40 miles an hour. They thought they'd copied every detail down to the hair on the wings. 
So what went wrong? Herky was built in one year, but it took nature millions of years to perfect real pterosaurs. That's because flight is one of the toughest skills an animal can master. Does Herky have the right stuff? They are. Herky's a wreck. You broke the neck. Half a million dollars of technology and a year's work are in jeopardy. The servo mount for the right pitch is broken. Why didn't Herky fly like a real pterosaur? The post-mortem reveals three problems. The first was a pterosaur brain malfunction. Luvara pushed one of his controllers in the wrong direction. Yeah. Next, the fur undercut Herky's ability to glide. The role of fur on real pterosaur wings is now more mysterious than ever. Finally, cosmetic changes interfered with Herky's flight and took him straight into the ground. No, no, uh, 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 uh. Herky is patched up and rebalanced. Good luck, Herky. forward. Yep, it's just lifting like crazy. Start your right turn. That would be good on, you know, for the launch cruise. We'll that would be going. great. For Tell her. them we're keeping climbing. Keeping climbing. Climbing. That's a good right there. Okay, don't dive. Five, four, three, two, one. There it goes. Okay, head on. Finally, Herky flies. That is looking good. For the first time in 65 million years, a nimble-winged pterosaur glided across the sky. The neck is not broken. Does it still have a pulse? But Herky and his kind didn't survive for millions of years just by gliding. They had to flap their wings. How did they do it? The answer again comes from birds and bats. They're the only two large animals alive today that can carry out a special wing motion that keeps them in the air. It's called the flight stroke. If you want to get up in the air, you have to do a certain kind of motion with your arms. And you can't just flap like this, it doesn't work. It actually requires a stroke that's down and forward, up and back, down and forward, up and back. Despite differences in their wing construction, birds and bats have similar flight strokes. But what about pterosaurs? Herky's flight stroke is a motion derived from fossil evidence. But figuring out a flight path for the moving wing is only half the problem. How did pterosaurs drive the motion? Pterosaurs had massive flapping muscles. In other words, they had a powerful engine. I was looking at the structure of the pterosaur forelimbs and the hind limbs and could see that their wings were very strong. They were very powerful wings. They had big muscle attachments and they could make what we call the flight stroke. Pumping wings at high power for a long time is something only warm-blooded creatures like birds and bats can do. They have a racing metabolism 
a V8 engine. Taken to the air requires a lot of energy and it requires sustained energy. If you want to stay up in the air, for safety's sake, you better be able to have a good energy reserve. Otherwise, you run out of gas and fall down in the middle of a big flight. It's not good for you. But pterosaurs were reptiles, and all living reptiles are cold-blooded. Were pterosaurs warm-blooded reptiles? We can't take the temperature of a pterosaur, but we can determine how fast it grew. And fast growers tend to be warm-blooded. If you look at the fine tissue structure of an animal's bones, you get a sense of how fast they're growing. That tissue is laid down differently in slow-growing and fast-growing animals. Cold-blooded animals grow slowly, and the signature of this low-energy lifestyle is engraved in their bones. They don't have a lot of blood vessels to fuel growth. The bones of pterosaurs look completely different. They are jammed with blood vessels that feed fast growth. Their bones show the same kind of tissue structure we see in fast-growing animals. That's very difficult to imagine doing without being something like what we would call warm-blooded today. And there's one more convincing clue. It's a fossil of a pterosaur that had fur not only on the wings, but also on the body. Discovered recently in Inner Mongolia, it comes from an animal with a big motor. Only a warm-blooded beast needs fur to conserve heat. They're burning energy like mad, and they're able to burn that energy in bursts when they really need to. Something about that kind of lifestyle requires a physiology like a bird that is burning fast and hot. Maybe pterosaurs would have felt warm if you touched one. They were everything but like today's reptiles. In addition to strong muscles that operate at high power, a pterosaur needs one more feature to execute the flight stroke. A strong airframe. And that's exactly what they have. Its core is a huge breastbone. It's braced to a framework of bones, including the shoulders. This chassis is where the powerful flapping muscles attach. This design of muscle and bone makes up the pterosaur's engine. So how will Herky evolve something like that? The flapping takes a lot of power. And there's a big wings, um, and it's flying at high speed. So we need a big motor. But the motor adds weight. An analysis of the last flight showed Herky was already heavy and descended too fast. Why? All this cosmetics that we put on actually took us back in flight ability. The elaborate head weighed too much. So Herky gets a lightweight replacement. And there's another problem, the paint they applied to the wings. To change the elasticity of the wing. And so what we had to do is to go back to material was still as stretchy as we really needed it. So to fly more like a real pterosaur, Herky has to look less like one. Shaved and in fighting trim, Herky evolves from glider to flapper. On a 300-foot steel cable, Herky gets his first chance to try out his flight stroke. What I really liked about today's test was how the flapping cycle looked. It looks very natural. We have the, the wings going in and out, as the pterosaur would have done and birds do. And I think that makes a tremendous difference. In an animal defined by its wings, 
the flight stroke is the key to survival. It let pterosaurs control the planet's skies. It may have even let them fly at birth. Along with a mega finger and a layered wing membrane, it's an essential secret of pterosaur flight. It may explain how these animals evolved into one of the planet's most skilled flyers. And it may also help explain the stunning results of the investigation into the largest animal that ever took to the skies. Perky's been worked over, crash tested, and refined. He's as close to a real pterosaur as the team can make him. But is he close enough? finger and a prayer, Perky takes off for the last time. Five, four, three, two, one, here we go. Now it's time to flap. After a single flight stroke, the wings jam. Herky's engine is too weak. He can't even get his wings back to level. Lavara bails out. She worked. 50 feet, 40, 20, touchdown. No, well, it doesn't look too bad. I think the yeah. should save this. Yeah. Off. I think we lost our clutch and gear. Oh, that's it. Yeah, look, look at, at that. that. <laughs> that's why it didn't flip. <laughs> I think we were spinning the motor with nothing. Yeah, the yeah. whole clutch system came apart. How mm. about that? Oh, that explains a lot. Well, it turns out that Herky was a runt. Yeah. Later calculations revealed that his flapping motor had only half the power a real pterosaur would have had. Still, Herky's wings helped rewrite the book on pterosaur flight. I'm really proud of the design of the wings. We build a wing that behaves beautifully in gliding flight. We can control the shape, and by controlling it, we can, we can steer the pterosaur. So that's been fantastic. But the real animals set an almost impossibly high standard. It was only by building Herky that we figured out just how skilled they were. They had the right stuff for flight. And they used it to conquer the globe. Tenacious hunters they adapted to different diets. Filtering, probing, scavenging, and in a tour de force of flight control, grabbing fish on the wing. They were quite amazing. They're compared to Every living animal that I know, every living flyer, a man-made flyer, I think the pterosaurs beat them all. In his hunt for a giant, Dino Fry now compares the sizes of footprints with fossil pterosaur bones and reaches a stunning conclusion. It became clear that there were pterosaurs that have a wingspan of more than 70 feet, which is simply unbelievable. Fry thinks it may be the largest creature ever to fly.
It would have been a monster, more Airbus than animal, almost beyond comprehension. Its eye may have been the size of a basketball. Its egg may have been as big as a playground trash can. And its wings would have been so long, it could have almost dunked at both ends of the court at the same time. Pterosaurs in general are such an enigmatic, interesting group because every time we think we know something about them, we're wrong. As a pterosaur is scaled up to gargantuan size, weight goes up faster than power. And this may give us an idea about how the ultra giant would have flown. If you're that big, you're certainly not going to be actively flapping for very long at a clip. Anything that big is going to have to be soaring most of the time. So, how could such a giant have fueled its flight? Most likely, they only could collect food, which was easy to get. In other words, pretty much anything that crossed its path. must have been so impressive and I can't describe you what I would do to see that life. The ultra giant would have felt nature's force just like any other creature. After ruling the skies for 150 million years, the sky monsters and the planet suffer a calamity. An asteroid strikes the Earth. By one theory, the aftermath wipes out the dinosaurs. The monstrous marine reptiles disappear too. And pterosaurs, master flyers, are gone forever. The skies are left to the birds and the bats. But for all their majesty, they'll never match the grandeur and weirdness of the greatest creatures to ever take wing. Dragons, of course, are fantastical creatures. Jaws full of teeth, huge wings. These, of course, are myths, never existed. But there were creatures who had all this. They were huge, they had big teeth, they had claws, and they were the pterosaurs.